So, Sarah, um, we're going to share some pictures today. Can you uh, can you tell us what we're about to share? And should I bring them up for you? Yes, yes, that would be great. Thank you. These are photographs that are actually part of the Imperial War Museum's collections. Um, I would heartily recommend anyone to, to have a browse through the, the Imperial War Museum collections because they're superb and they've got a lot of excellent material there. And I first came across these pictures sort of five or six years ago when we had some lottery funding um, to do some First World War centenary commemoration project work. And these are photographs that are taken in the Army Ordnance Depot in Dewsbury. Um, women working in there during the First World War. The depot was set up in June 1916 um, and continued in operation for the next couple of years um, and was set up essentially to be recycling um, and salvaging uniforms that the troops were wearing. Um, so they were collecting uniforms both from um, army camps in this country where the, the soldiers were being trained and also from the various um, frontline theatres overseas. Um, and during this two year period, um, they had, they thought about 35,000 tonnes of material um, with a value of over £2,300 in 1918 terms. Um, and uh, over 56 million garments. And some of these photographs were taken um, in October 1917. Don't have any record of this particular visit, but what we do have in 1918, in the end of May 1918, the King and Queen visited Dewsbury Batley, the heaven, heavy woolen district, as it was known then. And went to a series of did a series of mill visits around that area, including a visit to this this army ordnance depot, where they talked to some of the women working here. And I just think these are such a striking set of photographs. There's only six of them, but they show the women working with these enormous quantities of of fabric that are coming in, unpicking epaulets, taking off buttons. Um, and I think it's it's quite unusual to have a photographic record like this of women in the workplace at that point. You do see photographs from this time, obviously, but they tend to be very much those sort of staged portraits. And to actually see the real life photos of this makes it more human somehow. And some of the women are so, some of them look so young. Um, well, I was going to say that. that was we one of my to say, you... Yeah, how old do you think some of the, yeah. some of the girls were there? Because this there's a girl there who looks, you know, you know, 12, 13, maybe? Yeah, they look at 10 or so. I think certainly they were. The, the record, the fact that the King and Queen visited the following June after these photographs were taken is great because it does give you actually a record of what was happening. And they, when the King and Queen came and visited here, there is a, a specific mention of one young girl called Maggie Horbury, who was 13. And we know she's recorded because she presented a bouquet of roses to the Queen. So she's actually named in the in the newspaper article from 1918. And obviously finding the actual records of the women who are working there, I've, I've never been able to do. So we don't have names for, for these women and girls. Um, you're, not, you're not sure who these people are? No, and I suspect I've never even been able to establish with absolute certainty which building this is. Um, one of the other photographs where they're sort of they've got sack trolleys with the sacks of, of fabric on, on the trolleys you can see railway lines in the background of that um, and they're obviously coming in in huge quantities mm -hmm. um, you can see the great piles behind the women as, as they're sorting through them um, so but exactly the article talked about were they um were they... they would be sorting through them they're, they're coming in they're sorting through them and finding out essentially if they were fit for reuse so yeah. if they could be reworn then they would be um cleaned any repairs that that needed to be done would would happen they went on then to another um where was it i had this noted down there was another depot in ravensthorpe and if the, the uniforms were fit to be used again, they'd be sent off to this this second depot in, in Ravensort where they'd be cleaned, any mending that was needed to be done. And then they'd be shipped off again to be reworn by the next soldier. Mm -hmm. um, if they couldn't be then reused, then the fabric would have been recycled. Um, 
with obviously the that sort of side of fabric produ textile production being very big in that that particular part of North Kirklees. So it's a really good early example of of that idea of yes, nothing goes to waste. This particular army jacket is not necessarily up to being reworn as it stands, but that's no reason why the fibres can't then be reused. It can't be sort of ground down and the actual constituent fabric itself will be reused even mm. if that specific individual piece of clothing isn't um they so, had i think certainly 649 civilian female employees according to the 1918 report 10 civilian male employees which always makes me think well yes that's sort of they'll be the ones who had the positions of ostensibly some authority but i get the impression looking at some of these women that I would imagine they were probably the ones who actually ran the place. Um, but, uh, and, and we how, used the, sorry, go on. I was gonna say, how unusual is it for this work to happen? So was was this happening across other areas or was it literally you know, a, a Kirkley's thing? Was it, was it, was it? A... I don't know. I, I suspect it was quite likely that something similar was happening in other particularly strong textile areas. Um, we know that, mills and factories in North Kirklees were producing fabrics, blankets, textiles, not just for the British Army, but for the Russian Army and other allied um, nations as well. Um, but I'm sure there must have been perhaps whether, say, some of the cotton mills in over sort of more Manchester way were doing a similar operation with some different fabric types. Mm. Um, and obviously women would have been working in the mills prior to the war but I think it's quite interesting that breakdown of 649 female employees and 10 male employees how obviously because the majority of people yes that that shoddy shoddy and mungo um, processes um, was was established in that area um, but I suspect it would have happened elsewhere as well I mean it, it just, it's a really striking way of bringing home how the sheer quantities involved of, of what was being produced to service the army, just looking at those piles of, of cloth and, and uniforms in the background. Um, and when you couple that with then obviously the statistics that you can, that you hear back from the, the various frontline theatres and the human cost involved there. Um, well, I was going to think, think just the, the numbers that. bring that home. We, you did a project, didn't you, with some young people? What was uh, you were showing them the images? Is this? Is this? Tell me if this is right. And then you were, they they sort of commented about the their thoughts about it. What were their feelings about yeah. people about their age? What was the, What was the, tell us about the project that you did a few years ago and how the young. This was fun. As I say, this was a funded by the lottery and um, we were working with young people across Kirklees just to um, to mark and commemorate and research the, the First World War period, not just because a lot of them might have studied the First World War either at history or at university um, and knew perhaps about the battles and generals and, and that side of things, but what we wanted to do was look at what was happening in Kirklees during that First World War period. Um, and these photographs were a really interesting set of resources to use with them because it was a really good prompt for getting them to think about how different would it have been for children, young people of their age at that period. Because obviously it's particularly that, that picture of the, the young women, the young girls sorting the buttons where they probably were only sort of 12 or 13. Well, so were these young people that we were working with um, and pointing out to them that obviously school leaving age was much earlier than yes you're still at school now but a hundred years ago you'd probably have been in your last year or two of school if not potentially having already left school and started working and also thinking about in wider terms things like communications what it must be for these women who had probably got sons brothers husbands fathers cousins any other relatives serving overseas that they might have been waiting weeks, months, years, potentially even for news of them, to then be dealing with these, these uniforms that would have been worn by men in those circumstances. And 
might that have been a, a conflict for them to in emotionally to be thinking, well, yes, I'm, I'm worried about my husband or my son or my brother serving overseas. And here is this uniform that will have been worn by a man in, in that situation. Um, and just getting them to, to think about how 100 years in the grand scheme of things isn't really that long, but will be quite a different set of circumstances for these women and, and girls. Um, so it was a, an interesting thing for them to think about. We did some little sort of creative writing exercises where they wrote letters either to or from soldiers. And also, of course, as well with, with Kirk Lee's particularly having quite a strong conscientious objectors um, movements in this area. And would there potentially might any of them have had conflict with that where they were or other members of their family or friends might have been conscientious objectors and yet here they were they might not have been fighting but they were supporting and part of the wider war effort mm. um so they were they were an interesting set of resources to use and just because they're so they're real people they're such striking pictures you can really get a sense i think of the the personalities of, of some of these people mm. um yeah, you, and you wonder sort of what conversations stories. must they have had. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You read stories into their faces and the conversations. It's mm. an interesting sort of thing about bringing them to life through photography, which I suppose was at, at a relatively early stage. Uh, at that mm. point, I was going to ask about the media and about how this was portrayed or represented. Can you tell us a bit about that? Um, I didn't find a huge amount at the time of particularly. Uh, Bearing in mind as well, obviously, a lot of the war effort, war work that was happening wasn't always very heavily reported on because there was, scenes, there was some sort of censorship or the, the thought that you didn't want to, to report about exactly what was happening because enemy agents might have read it or, or so on. Um, but certainly the impression you get from the 1918 report is quite a sense of, of pride that everyone had turned out in their best sort of most neatly pressed and, and what have you uniforms for wearing in in for the visit and also just that sort of sense of feeling of, of support and, and the work they were doing um, but I do remember finding an editorial I think in the Dewsbury Reporter talking about children and young people being out on the streets late at night or later at night and picking up on the fact that women perhaps were obviously working much more than they would have been prior to the war because so many men had gone overseas and women had stepped into those positions and that idea of yes children are out without proper parental control because their their mothers are working and their fathers are serving overseas so there was that sort of you get a bit of a dichotomy of yes we're proud of, of the work that's going on um and the the support that's being given but at the same time this sort of it, it it was that thing of yes some things don't seem to have changed very much at all the editorials you might see in a newspaper now where someone might say oh all these children who aren't getting their proper parental input into their uh, or the control over what they're doing um outside of school or something so yeah there was a, a bit of a perhaps a bit of a conflict there maybe and how how about okay so this was during the first world war we know that in both world wars women stepped in to sort of do mm. a huge amount of work whereas they weren't maybe weren't doing so before or, or not quite so much tell me about the impact that you think this might have had uh after the war i mean i as I say, the women would have been working in the, the factories. And I noticed one of the other comments earlier that came through while we were talking just now about the shoddy industry and, and women working in that, that industry in, in this area. And they certainly were, but I, I'm sure there must have been a lot more women or only women working in, in, in these sort of places. And I can imagine that if you had been a woman who had stepped up during the war, whichever war to say right yes I will now take the place of a man and have clearly demonstrated that actually I'm perfectly capable of doing this to then have that point where someone comes back and says right well now we expect you to go back to how you had been living and behaving before mm -hmm. because we took we took 
used to, or we used you for for what we needed while we needed it but we don't anymore so you can just go back to that idea of yes go back to your kitchens kind of thing I can imagine that if someone had said that to me at that point I'd have said um no I don't think so um and I know I think I think one of the items Katina's going to talk about is one of the the suffrage banners in the, the Tolson collections that's right and I'm sure that the work that women had done during the war must have contributed to that sense of actually no we do we should have more say and more representation and more power in everyday life in political life in working life and better rights than we have had up till now because you were quite happy to to get us involved when you needed us and we can't now just be moved aside again no i think that's a really good point um, and i think i think i do think katina will will sort of pick up on those those threads in, in her in, in our conversation with, with katina so uh, noticing some of the chat that's come in uh we've got a, a, a stuff about the shoddy in uh shoddy and uh, let's 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 maybe park that shoddy conversation till afterwards because actually this, that's quite an interesting point and maybe uh, we could sort of talk a little bit more and bring some more people in at the end of both you and, uh, and, and Katina's talks because I'm quite interested in that idea as well. I just want to read this comment. It said it says, um, but it was work in the shoddy industry was heavily dependent on female labour, poorly paid, and with shocking conditions. The fibres and the dust were a particular hazard. Have you mm. got any evidence to suggest that this had an effect on the, the women's health? Or? Um, not off the top of my head, but I'm sure if someone actually went to look i mean we've got things like the medical officer of health reports um and just sort of reports of industrial conditions more generally i'm sure that the material is there it just needs to be yeah. to be found to, to be pulled out and highlighted um ah well there we go katina yeah, well, says yeah shoddy fever yeah, yeah well, uh, the um, bit of my play i'd really recommend if you're interested in sort of uh old footage of various things it's all free you can all watch it, mm. you can watch it for free i've been watching bits and pieces on the bfi player uh, much to my wife's um annoyance because she's like what's this silly stuff and i was like well it's very it's very it's very interesting you know sort of social history and it's all available to watch for free so that's really good mm. um yeah so have a look at the bfi player um Let's 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 part the shoddy stuff and go back to it. Come back to it at the end, I think. Um, but I'm uh, I just wanted to end this particular bit on 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 uh, on Catherine's um, point there, which is these images are amazing. What did you? Did, uh, they are rare, aren't they? These images. They aren't sort of the normal run of the mill to, to coin a phrase. I <laughs> pretty good. Um, I yeah, I, I think they are unusual. Definitely, I think just. The fact, I mean, certainly within the local studies collections, we've got some quite good collections of people working in mills. There's some fantastic pictures um, from slightly earlier than the First World War um, of a mill, I think, in Lockwood, um, which are a little more staged than these are. Um, but I think just actually photographic recording of everyday working conditions from this period is rare enough um the fact i suspect of it of it being these women and girls is rarer still i'm just i just remember coming across them and thinking they were fantastic and being so caught by them um yes absolutely and yeah very much that tin of and i presume it was that they're sorted perhaps by regiment and I'm sure by size as well, where say a pocket button would have been a different size or shape from a shirt button, a shirt front button or an epaulette button, that kind of thing. So I suspect there's probably all sorts of, of sorting going on. I think there was some, yes, 50 million buttons they reckon they'd sorted in a two year period up to, to June 1918. The King, I think, particularly was interested in the buttons. The other thing that the King did comment on was that he queried whether anyone had been infected while they were working. I think he was thinking about any infection that might have come on the textiles, on the uniforms from the front lines. So if any soldiers had been suffering from a particular condition, if anyone in the, the mill had then picked that up um, and he was assured that no, nobody he had. 
Um, of course, it was the, you know, we're going through our own pandemic. It was the Spanish flu, wasn't it? So Yeah, yeah. And yes, lice, I'm sure they must have done. But the king was assured that there had been no cases of infection. Yes. I'm sure that <laughs> you wouldn't have told the king that there were, even if it had been. Um, but I just found them, I just came across them purely by chance when I was browsing through the Imperial War Museum collections. So as I say, I would recommend that definitely. And uh, thank you to my colleague Lorna, who I've seen is attending, who very kindly found the newspaper, the 1918 newspaper report for me yesterday. Brilliant. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I think we're going to move on. I just wanted to sort of just flag up those the the sort of the link to that social change that sort of does. It, so it's not just for women. There is the sort of the the idea of um, workplace conditions and uh, also mm. sort of something about the sort of recycling we're using, which I think is has always been there, but it's only in the last few years it's become a sort of a such a massive thing. It, it was kind. Of, I, I think about my grandma's generation who it was just always you know that was what you did um but it wasn't yeah. very particular it was just because of poverty in my my case in my family's case but um yeah so I think, I think it seems to go through cycles almost yeah. doesn't it that as, as people have said that yes shoddy is a process the idea of using jars and tins to to do the sorting here um and make do and mend during the second world war but it, it seems to to come back up to the up to the fore again as a more of a movement almost. Yes. So I think this uh, we're going to go back in time a little bit more. I'm going to say th well, thank you, Sarah. We'll see you at the end if that's all right. If you want to. Thank sort you. Of, I'll uh, turn if, my video right, off. We'll give you a round of applause, but it'll just have to be <laughs> a gentle ripple. But thank you so much, Sarah. So as I say, we're going to go back in time a, bit, a bit more, and we are sort of going to focus on that that sort of both those issues of workers' conditions and. Um, and uh, the sort of the well, women's suffrage essentially. Uh, so why don't we co why don't we have a look? Uh, if if Katina, if you want to put your video on, then we'll be able to see you. Hello, Katina, and so thank you so much for joining us. So um, you're going to share your screen that, of, of images. Do you want to tell us before you do that who you are and where where your what your background is and where you come from? Okay, I'm uh, I'm Katina Bill. I'm the senior curator for um, Kirklees Museums and Galleries. Uh, I've been here 20 years, I think it is just over 20 years. Um, yeah, um, so I've worked with um, a wide range of the collections um, and have worked with them, um, have done some research into the shoddy industry as well. So uh, that that was really, um, that was interesting. Costume and textiles was, was my particular interest um, before I came to before I came to Kirtley, so yeah. Great. So, can you, if you want to share your screen, you should show us some images. I think you're going to start with the uh, the Skelman Thought flag, which some people will have seen, some people will have heard of. Yes, I am. Yeah. Oh, some people may not have heard of it, especially people watching the recording. So, if you could just tell us who made it, when, why, tell us a bit about this flag, because uh, uh, you're going to show us a picture of it. I think there we are. Okay, you've got that. Good. Um, yeah, okay, this is um, a Skelmanthorpe flag um, that was made uh, in 1819, I think, um, or thereabouts. Uh, the information we have that came when, when um, from the person who, who donated it is that it was made by somebody called Mr. Bird, who was um, a designer um, in Skelmanthorpe. Uh, which, for those of you who don't know, is um, a village outside, oh, where are we, 10 miles from Huddersfield. It's between Huddersfield and Sheffield uh, and was very much um, a mill um, village. Uh, it was full of um, handloom weavers, cottages. Um, so yeah, it was made in, um, as you say, we think this was made in 1819 um, to, um, in response to the Peterloo massacre um, in Manchester um, in 1819, uh, which most of you probably know about, but that was when um, Hem uh, a large public meeting um, that Henry Hunt 
was speaking about parliamentary reform. He was also um, in favour of the repeal of the Corn Laws. And there was a huge public turnout. And basically the authorities panicked and sent the militia in who um, cut people down, literally mm. cut the crowd down with sabres and rifles. And do you know off the top of my head, I have no idea what numbers actually died, but it was a large number, um, including children and babies, I think. Um, and it was, it was, um, yeah, it was an absolutely appalling event. It was also a national, there was a national outcry. Uh, but of course, Manchester is not so very far from us either. Um, so um, the people of Skelmanthorpe, or at least this one person from Skelmanthorpe produced this flag. Um, which does have the, the that's the reference there to the uh, to the Manchester sufferers pouring balm into the wounds of the Manchester sufferers. Well, if anyone's seen the, the Mike Lee film recently, it, it really is quite shocking, isn't it? You know, you can read about this stuff and you can see, you know, you can just, but actually seeing it depicted in that way, I mean, it might be sort of slightly hollowed but it was very, it was a shocking scene, wasn't it? it yeah. And, and when, the, say, this flag was made in response to the, you know, various sort of conditions of, of workers and, as you said, the Manchester sufferers, but who displayed it and what effect did it have? What was it? Was it, you know, tell me about that. It, well, it was carried at various... Um, well, I was going to say similar protests, but obviously not similar in terms of the disastrous outcome, but um, a great many, there were many public protests. People were marching all over the local countryside and they were marching literally across the countryside um, in many cases um, to protest against um, working conditions, um, against, well, particularly against the poor law, against the corn laws, um and for um for the vote as well um and and this was just for for the for men to have the vote um parliament was largely unreformed at this time it's when there were a lot of the rotten boroughs um and only a few people actually had had the vote so there were as far as we know the flag was um taken um and carried at uh, a number of, well, a great many events, um, but particularly one in Wakefield in 1930, in 1838, sorry, where it had to be um, transported there, hidden in, uh, apparently hidden in a flower cart uh, because it was basically um, the messages that are on it it was illegal if it was found. It was the supposedly the um, the constable of Skelmanthorpe had been um, tasked with it with finding it and destroying it. So uh, it was kept it was kept hidden. Um, we do know for certain that it was carried um, at a very large meeting um, at Peep Green on Hartshead Moor. Um, in 1837. This is thought to at the time to have been the single biggest public political meeting at the time. Um, and the note I've got written down is that there were 250,000 people present, which is an enormous number. I'm wondering whether I've accidentally added a zero on the end <laughs> of that. I'm, I'm not sure, but it, it may be not. It, but it was an enormous event and it was. Um, reported on in the the Leeds time Leeds Times and we know that this particular flag was carried there because they actually um, describe it in the report um, it's actually really singled out um, there was a danger to this flag seemingly I like I find that quite fascinating that they, they there is actually this flag. is actually a copy of the report I know you won't be able to re read that um, but as I say, this enormous event where there were various flags, but that section near the bottom is actually quoting, it quotes um, pieces from the um, from the flag. So it was really picked out in this, um, this Leeds Times um, report. So I think it was um, I mean, this... a particularly 
yeah, it must have been a particularly striking. Um, yeah, it's almost as if the, uh, the people were like, if only this flag is wasn't seen, then people wouldn't have the same kind of ideas. And it's sort of slightly <laughs> smacks of, uh, of recent stuff. It's like, well, if, you know, people will still have the ideas no matter what images they see. And I think it's it, yes. you know, people want yeah. to ban things or sort of stop things being out there, images yeah. of, that are poss possibly embarrassing to governments or whatever. And you think, well there's still that feeling within people and that's the more important really the flag is just an, a, a sort of demonstration of it and yeah. um, you, you you told me a little bit on, over email about some really interesting sort of slightly secret or unusual questions about the flag do you want to talk about a couple of those yeah um let's just go back to yeah. the um so that's the obviously that's the overall image of the flag there with um yeah it's got its four quadrants um with different um different sections and we've got the bit about the manchester sufferers that i've mentioned um and then we've got the the lower corner um opposite that um with the, well the references to different parts of the union um then um Across from that, the lower um, right quadrant has this kneeling figure um, under the all-seeing eye, the cha a chained figure actually, and the, the, the banner, am I not a man or brother? Um, and that is directly taken, which you've just seen clips of, from um, this image, which was produced by the Wedgwood Company in 1787 Josiah Wedgwood was um, an abolitionist um, and he produced medallions Jasper Ware medallions with this image on um, in support of of the abolitionist movement and it, it it's widely recognized um, uh, as being an anti-slavery um, figure um, and yeah, clearly that is the figure that's in the um, that's shown on the on the flag. Um, except that the image on the flag is is not black; it's white. It's a white figure, um, but it is actually described again in that Leeds Times report of um, the Peep Green gathering, where they describe the the flag. Uh, the reporter there refers to it as having a figure of a Negro slave the kneeling negro slave in chains um so he obviously just recognized that as as being um as being representation of a negro figure um i suppose what it would be these days you might call it intersectionality so people have different sort of things going on and it all sort of comes together yeah, and, you know so if, yeah. you're not, if you're sort of trying to go for workers rights you're also caring about the slavery I, and you're i think so, yeah really yeah um, I mean, I certainly when I first saw the flag, I just thought, oh, yes, it's that it's the kneeling Negro slave and never really thought of any more about it. And then actually it was sort of a while after it dawned me, actually, you know, it's not a black figure. So we did wonder whether um, because it had been described as a Negro figure um, that it whether it had originally been black and it had faded but we've had the flag analyzed we've had that section analyzed uh, microscopically and there is no evidence that it was ever actually um, painted in black but I think it is still um, it is seen as showing sympathy for for the slavery and or perhaps drawing parallels um, between some workers conditions um, and the conditions of slavery Okay, well, let's let's skip forward because I think we're we, if if we if we can skip forward, is that okay to uh, the next <laughs> image, the the banner? So, okay, uh, yeah. This sort of relates to a little bit about what um, Sarah was saying around uh, yes. the women who worked in those uh, industries. So yeah. Skipping forward, what is it? About a hundred years. Okay. Oh, I've stopped sharing, haven't I? And there we go. Yes, almost exactly a hundred years further forward. So you got that okay? Yeah, see that? yeah. You can see a few images there. So maybe. Oh, it's yes. Yeah, it's that it should be that one it. there. Tell us about this one. Yeah, let's make that full screen. There, you got that. Yeah. Okay, right. So this is um, a suffragist banner. Um, made um, around 1907 to 1911 by uh, Florence Lockwood. Um, she was um, 
a woman originally from the south, but she'd married into a liberal mill owning family um, in Linthwaite. Um, and um, she became very interested in, um, I suppose we call the women's movement and um, women's suffrage. Um, we think particularly after 1907, when there was a by-election, a particularly contentious by-election that took place um, in the Colm Valley where, where she lived. Um, and at that um, by-election, um, there was the Liberal candidate um, who, as I say, she was from a, she, she was a Liberal herself, so she was supporting the Liberal candidate, but there was also um, a Socialist candidate who, and Emelina and Adela Pankhurst actually came across from Manchester and spoke um, at the, um, spoke in Linthwaite um, in support of the Socialist um, candidate. Um, and Florence Lockwood um, supported the, the principles of women's suffrage and freedom, but, but as a liberal, she wasn't able, she didn't feel able to support the Pankhurst's um, socialist radicalism. And there was actually this split in the women's movement at the time. There were, there were two groups and she, there were the suffragettes, um, that were the Pankhursts, and then there were also suffragists. So this flag is actually a banner. This banner is actually a suffragist banner, technically speaking, rather than a suffragette banner, because uh, Florence Lockwood um, joined the NUWSS, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, um, rather than, and I've forgotten the acronym for the one that the Pankhurst were involved in. So the NUWSS was um, used, was interested in using debate and legislative, legisl can't say it, legislative change to gain the vote rather than the more radical um, and violent approach um, of the, the Pankhursts. Um, but she was also president of the Colm Valley Women's Liberal Association. So she created this banner when, um, when she became involved in the local branch of the NUWSS um, and actually wrote about it um, in her, she did keep a diary and then she also wrote her autobiography. Um, and she recalled it in her autobiography that I joined the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies and embarked on making a great banner, Votes for Women, Huddersfield, for the members of the branch to carry in demonstrations and processions. And she actually presented the banner to her uh, to the local branch in 1911. And um, we know that because it was um, actually reported in the Common Cause newspaper, which was the newspaper of, of, the, um, of the national organisation. It's not quite as simple as that, is it? There's something <laughs> interesting about, um, about <laughs> that slogan, Votes for Women. Tell me about um, what really is going on there, because it's not, I was quite surprised at this. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, well, yeah, I mean, as I say, she, she wrote in her autobiography that she put, produced this great banner, Votes for Women, Huddersfield. And when she donated it to us, um, she donated it in 1928, which was the year that the women um, got the vote on the same grounds as men. So it was donated to the museum kind of in celebration, I think, of that. Um, and she told us at the time that it had been carried on the notorious mud march in London in February 1907, that it was carried by her, uh, Mrs. Lockwood and Miss E.F. Sidden, um, and also that it was carried at the coronation procession in 1911. But it doesn't seem like all of that is actually quite true. Um, I mean, she did actually, the, the banner there, that's a detail there. It is signed by her. Um, and there's the date, 1907. Um, but um, she only actually seemed to become interested 
in the suffrage movement in 1907. And the mud march took place in February, beginning of February. It was something like the 2nd of February, 1907. There is no way she got this banner made um, for that. It can't have been carried at that. It just wouldn't have been made. And it wasn't actually presented to the, to the society, to the local branch until 1911. As I say, we know that for certain from the, the common cause. Um, and when you actually look at the banner in more detail, and particularly when you turn it over, um, it's a beautifully made banner, really lovely workmanship or work womanship, really, I should say. Um, and it's all been made, all this embroidery, applique, um, and then a backing fabric has been put on it um, and finished off with, with a binding. And then the stitches that say 1907 go through the backing fabric. So they are clearly added at a later date um, and possibly quite substantially later. And they look different. The workmanship of it looks very different. But that's not the only change that was made. Um, and I think that one was later on. But actually, the slogan changed. Um, so if you look at the detail here of where it says women, um, there are, can you see my yeah, we can see that. thing there? Yeah. So if you can oh. see, there is a join there yeah. and there is a patch here because those two, the letters W and N are, are later additions. They've been changed. The banner actually originally said votes for homes, <laughs> which we know because another issue of the common cause actually um, had a piece about um, the banner in 1911 um, and shows a photograph of it when it said votes for homes. Um, and of course, it's only two, two letters that have changed and it was done ever so carefully. Um, so although she said in her autobiography, I set out to make this banner votes for women, Huddersfield, that's not what she actually made initially. <laughs> she actually made a banner that said votes for homes. Yeah, it makes me think that she was, Frances Lockwood was an early virtue sickler. She was, she, <laughs> she was getting her Instagram all sorted, but was she actually really involved with the movement? That's what <laughs> Oh, I think I'm. I'm pretty sure she was very much involved with the movement. Okay, she did. Um, she did write. No, she was. Yeah. Um, she hosted a lot of the meetings well, and good. things. Yeah, because I was sort of thinking, is she a complete fraud? This this long. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh goodness, no, no. I wouldn't. I, I would definitely wouldn't want to suggest that. Um, but no, it is curious that there it's are um, there are these changes. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we're going to move on, actually, Katina, because uh, on that on that bombshell, is it's, it's, it's quite it's quite it's quite interesting. So when you dig deeper, isn't it? Uh, so yeah. thank you, and I think people are sort of really sort of commenting on that in the in the comments. What I'd like to do is if you could stop sharing your screen, Katina. Yes, that's what I'm trying that. to do, and I'm trying to oh. find the stop <laughs> the share thing. button. I think I if I close the screen, it will stop. Oh, oh. there we go. There we go, and. Uh, this is going to come to the end of Katina's little bit, but we're now going to bring everyone back. But before we do, I just want to say thank you to Katina. That was that was really wonderful. And I know that you could probably talk for hours and hours about all sorts of things. So we've had to sort of really sort of hone in on a couple of um, Im images. And it's a real pleasure to have both you and Sarah. So thank you, Katina. And let, you know, that do that thing of, of sort of a gentle ripple of applause and then putting some nice comments in the chat that would be lovely and as you're doing that if you'd like i will i will stop the recording and i'll wrap it up in a second um but in a minute we can all just join us uh, in a small group and we can all just sort of have a chat so um so i'd say thank you to sarah and katina thank you all for joining us and um yeah off we go